I could be there, right? I'm good enough to be there. You're going to stumble, you're going to fall, but it's going to just be something you laugh at in the future. Could you tell that you had a gift, that you were superior than most of the kids out on the field? The coach had us do 10 push-ups. I might sneak in 11 just because I think I'm going to get a little bit better there because I got one more push-up than you. Then I became like obsessed with playing college football. Oh, he believes I can, then I can. Start hanging out with that guy more. I want to see what you're eating because I need to eat. What's in your cereal? <laughs> I think if you could bottle that up, you'd be a very rich man just just having the natural abilities, that's not going to do it. That wasn't an option, right? So it's like, this is it. You guys are going to love this week's episode of Boundary Breakers. We sit down with Terrell Mays. Terrell is a former professional football player, Division One football at San Diego State, played for the Baltimore Ravens. Terrell offers some unbelievable advice that he learned on and off the field, from his high school coach's words of wisdom to what he learned the first day he walked onto campus at San Diego State to his first experience in a meeting room in the NFL with Ray Lewis. From confidence in the role that it plays in a career to the interesting tidbits about what makes a Hall of Famer that much better than everybody else. You guys are going to love this episode. Boundary Breakers is brought to you by Carter and Clark. If it's all right with you, what, I, what I'd love to do is start just with a little bit about kind of your your story, where you came from, where you grew up, um, and then we can transition into uh, some football talk, which I'm looking forward to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I, I'm really curious about, you know, as we get into this, the the experience you had and the lessons that you learned and how um, how those have translated into whether just life lessons or into your career. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, what you're doing now with Microsoft. So for sure, definitely. that's good for you. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from. I know you were born in, born in California, at least went to school in California. So just so, just so the audience knows sort of who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually um, the third of five, uh, two older sisters, two younger brothers. Um, Everyone born in Southern California except for me. I was actually born in Colleen, Texas. Um, oh. So I so I just joke I have, you know, bloodline from two of the two of the best football states, Texas <laughs> and California. Um yep. but I I, w- I left there when I was, you know, I was maybe four years old. I don't remember much of Texas. That's my father's side. Um, but I grew up in Southern California. Um went to high school, San Monica High School. I w- went on to play full scholarship at San Diego State. Um, yeah, I, I've always been super competitive. My siblings super competitive. Yeah, that's 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 pretty yeah. much the background. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, so tell me, tell me about high school. Were you, um, you know, were you a standout star on your high school football team? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I always joke too when um my high school team was actually really good. We won a we won a championship. Um, nice. My my high school team. We had another a teammate. My one of my best friends. Growing up, he he went on to play professionally as well. We had a guy that went on to play baseball professionally. Uh, they ran track in college. A couple other guys that played Division One football. Um, we're, wow. we're 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 so good to the point where I don't even think I got an award on at our banquet. You know, like, oh really? Yeah, and I went on to you know have success. Uh, yeah, in the sports. Wow. So yeah, I, I I was one of those kids growing up. I was into all the sports. My mom just threw me into all the sports. I was. Yeah, you know, track, basketball, football, played a little baseball. I think my sophomore year of high school, I had a football coach kind of let me know, "Hey, you're not that tall. Uh, if you yeah. focus on football, you might you might be able to do something." That's one. I got you. Got gotcha. you. No, that's interesting. I was because my next question I was going to ask, you know, at what point did you did you realize that you were passionate about football and really wanted to pursue it? Yeah, that was definitely it. I was, I think my first love was basketball. Uh, I think, I, you know, there's a lot of, I appreciate about basketball. It's one of those sports you can kind of go play on your own and get lost in football. You need yeah. that team, but, which I really appreciate the team aspect. But yeah, after I had that conversation with the coach as a sophomore, he, I think I was one of those kids, super ambitious. I, you couldn't tell me I wasn't going to play for the Lakers and the Raiders and the Dodgers. <laughs> you know, I was going to be that guy. And when I was, you know, yeah. young dreams. And then as you get older, you kind of, focus in but I think he was the first person outside of my own head that told me you can do it and he was specifically talking about football and I think at that moment um 
I mean, which speaks to how important encouragement is to young young athletes at that moment. It just sparks like, oh, he believes I can, then I can. And at that, then I became like obsessed with playing college football. That was just everything. I just want to play college football. Uh, so as a sophomore in high school, a little inspiration from a position coach that you know believed in me, and it just, it just took off from there. Yeah. Wow, that's unbelievable. So were you one of were you one of the, the, those athletes that? you know, everything just pretty much came naturally. And um, you felt like when you stepped on the field, you can compete with anybody or um, were you a gym rat constantly working or, or a little bit of both? I think it was a little bit of both. I was always a little more athletic than my friends, I think, growing up. I remember, you know, playing silly games like, let's see if we could jump over this lunch table. And then I, yeah, would, try sure. to, I would try to jump over the taller lunch table, just pushing myself. I remember always gotcha. being a little faster, a little stronger. But... I also was the type of kid, let's say if the coach had us do 10 pushups, I might sneak in 11 just because I think I'm going to get a little bit better there because I got one more pushup than you. And I think it's, so I was always, uh, I had a friend in middle school. We would go to the gym and see if we could make 500 jump shots. That type of stuff was fun to me. And I didn't even realize I was putting in all this extra work because I was just passionate. I would skip steps when I walked up because I thought it would make me fat. You know, I was just, I was obsessed yeah. with getting better in every little way. I'm sure incrementally that added up and helped me, but I, I did have some natural. Yeah. Gosh, that's, that's, that's amazing. Did, could you tell when you were in high school and, and, and I, I asked this because, you know, maybe for the kid watching who's in high school or, or college, um, who has a dream, could you tell you know, maybe your junior, senior year in high school that, that you, that you had a gift that you were superior than, than most of the kids out on the field. I mean, or, yeah, like, I think, I think so. Um, and like I said, we, there was a couple of guys, I would say there were a core group, maybe four of us where we were, we all started on varsity as sophomores. And then uh, as juniors, it started like we had each other to compete with. I yeah. got, like we, we were so competitive with each other. I was super blessed to have that kind of group to grow up with. Um, so then when we played other people, it was like, y you're not going to touch us, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I no, I, I think even within our group, we all had our strengths, right? So like, I was probably one of the faster ones, guy that was stronger. So it always gave us something to work towards too. I, yeah. didn't get, I didn't get too complacent because I know there's a guy next to me who has better hands than me when it comes to catching the football. Yeah. I, I can't be, you know, I can't settle it where I am, but. Right. I hear you. Well, look, believe it or not. Um, so I played a little college football myself. I was an option quarterback in high nice. school in Georgia. And um, I went, I went to the Citadel in South Carolina, uh, you know, military school to run the, to run the triple option. Um, I was, was not very good. It, I didn't play. I did not play. Uh, I didn't get on the field in college, but, um, I, football's always been my, my passion, my, lo my love. I mean, I, I could still tell you all, almost every play that we ran in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, vivid memories of being on the field with my teammates. Um, so, which I'm sure that you have. So, so, uh, at what, at what point did you start talking to colleges or, or, were you highly recruited or how, how did that work for you? You know, it's funny. Uh, it's keep going back to that group. So I'll never forget, um, you know, we all started getting letters. I'll say some of the guys started getting letters after that junior season. And I remember my coach would lock into, walk into the locker room and he has this, you know, pile of letters because we were, yeah. and he's handing them out. He's calling our names. I'm trying to play it cool looking like, man, he's going to say my name. I'll never forget when I got my first one, it was from. So I'll, I'll say I was one of the last of the good players to get recruited as far as letters. And, you know, knowing, knowing what I know now that, you know, they only mean so much that early in the process, but right, it means everything. It's everything in the world as a kid, you know, that wants to play college football. I told you I was already obsessed with the idea. So I'll never yeah. forget. I got a, just a basic letter from Oregon. Uh, they probably had my name on the list. Um, yeah. I went, I went into the bathroom at home. I locked the door, you know, with five, four siblings. That's one of the few places you can get privacy. I remember I, I just sat there and read the letter over. And, over. and oh. then from then, you know, you, you know, it's like the best moment because it was a dream. Um, like, wow, somebody else outside of my own head sees that I'm a decent football player. Um, but then 
beyond that, I I wouldn't say I was too heavily recruited. The story I heard even that got me to San Diego State is the team we beat in the championship my senior high school, they had a core group of good players. Uh, apparently, San Diego State scout went there, uh, but those guys didn't have grades. So their coach said, hey, go look at the kids over at this school and specifically called out me and one of my close boys. That's how I got on their radar, which, you know. Nice. Thanks to him, uh, I got recognized with San Diego State. So wow. I, got a, I got some attention. You know how it goes. Sure. Once you get one offer, more schools come and so forth. So I got yep. a little more attention after that. I love it. I love it. I wasn't, so I wasn't those a big the, fan of the process. Oh, go ahead. Well, I want to hear, I, I, I hear more about that. I was just going to say for those in the audience, um, the way that it works in, in for recruiting colleges recruiting high school kids is um they build an initial database and then they send they mail back when we were in high school they mailed letters to the school that the coach would get and then the coach would hand out the letters from the different colleges to the the, the kids on the team that were being looked at and so well i'll just i do want to say this to be on to get on oregon's list you had to be <laughs> pretty damn good so uh you're, you're, you're obviously very modest, but, um, it's amazing. I, I've heard so many stories about, uh, guys that have gone on to have unbelievable careers and they were only noticed because the coach was, was watching tape or watching film on one game. And they're like, who's the guy on the other team, you know, right. had found him that way. But, uh, so you have a, you have a similar story, but so you, you say you weren't, you, you were not a fan of the recruiting process. No, uh, I mean. I was one of those, and I also got a, I was, I had pretty good grades, good SAT scores. So a lot of Ivy League schools too were reaching out. Okay. And, I, and I, you know, at that time I had never been on a plane. Um, I was very much Southern California. I didn't know much outside of my bubble. So the thought of even going on recruiting trips was kind of, uh, I remember um, actually committed to the University of Hawaii and I backed out of my recruiting oh. trip because I was scared to take the flight five hours over oh, wow. water. <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, as it, as it went on, I, I committed pretty early to Hawaii. Then San Diego State came on. And honestly, a big part of it was sold me was two hours away from Los Angeles. My family could come see me play. Thought of that was like, that's like as far enough to get some independence, but close enough to stay connected. So the thought yeah. of that was everything to me. So I committed pretty early and then. I just, I was really like, I don't want to hear it anymore. Like, I'm going to San Diego State, but you know, they pop up a little more. I was done. Yeah. 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 It's funny how that works, right? As soon as you make your decision, all of a sudden other, others come knocking. You're like, wait a minute. Right. All of a sudden, before yeah. I was, <laughs> before I was committed, you didn't want to talk. Now you do, right? Well, so, uh, all right. So you finished out high school and then um, you're a freshman again, San Diego State. So ha tell us about that. How, how what was it like going in, going from high school to college? <laughs> I always tell people so. I, the jump from high school to college to me was bigger than the jump from college because you're a kid now. You're playing with men versus you know what I mean. So I'll never forget. Uh, my mother drove me down the first day we were supposed to report to training camp, and one of my teammates that was in the garage happened to be like our biggest defensive end. Honestly, probably one of the toughest people on the team was unloading his his car. I didn't even have my own car. He has a car. He's a grown man. And he had like a cutoff shirt. He's like, just ripped. My mom said, that's your teammate? I, was, I said, I think so. He has San Diego State football shorts. She looked at, she, <laughs> she looked at me and said, good luck. And I just, I mean, <laughs> and just like that, that's my teammate, right? So, I, and I always tell the story, I'll shout out to one of my teammates, Marvio Underwood. He, uh, he was the first like I said, in high school, we had a group of good, talented players. Where we all had, somebody had something that they were good at, right? And it pushed us in that way. He was the first athlete I met where I was like, I have nothing on him. He's faster than me. He's stronger than me. You know, it was just like, that was the first yep. time I, I encountered that. I guess I'm, a, I'm proud of my response in hindsight. I just wanted to keep, you know, I challenged him every day. I wanted to work out with him. I'm, you're my partner in all the drills. But I think those two, like, experiences were just super humbling. Like, oh, and then you couple that with now you're on your own, you have to deal with class, you know, that transition in itself, just becoming, you know, independent, learning how to be a student, no adult supervision and all those temptations that come along with that. Yeah. Uh, 
going from high school to college, that was, I struggled a little bit my freshman year, if I'm being honest, just adjusting, like, even just in the classroom, had good grades in high school, getting away with studying and cramming at the last minute, didn't work the same, right? And then, you know, I'm about to get I have football because I'm like 5'11", 160. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, so. so did they, did, uh, were you, did they, did they give you a hard time as a freshman because of your size? Or I, I, look, I imagine 5'11", 160, I imagine there was several other kids on the team that you, you that's around that size, right? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Uh, there were, at the, when I joined, there was maybe two or two others that were like smaller. So that, that was a, I think my nickname when I first got there was Mouse. Uh, some people <laughs> might, still, might, might still call me that to this day, but, uh, okay. I mean, you know, once you kind of, you show your co- you're willing to compete. You, you got some toughness to you. You can play play the game, and it seems because you earn respect. So I think it's more about who you are. Uh, I think yeah, they had some jokes and some fun around it, but at the end, I think it. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. You know, one of the things that I I found fascinating, um, just my limited experience at the college level. You know, in, in high school, it felt like. You know, you, you played a good team and, and they, they would have one or two one or two guys on the team that were that were really good, right? That they were right. maybe they were carrying their team. And then, you know, you get to college and it's like you've got a whole team full of those type of people. Exactly. Um but what was also what I what I also found so interesting is that there were there were several folks on several guys that, that were teammates of mine that were just from a raw talent perspective, just among the best athletes that I'd have ever seen. You right. know, like Four, five, four, six guys with a forty-two inch vertical, you know, bitch at three forty, right? But um, often that doesn't always translate onto the on the field, right? I mean, you can have somebody that, like, I remember. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to mention his name, but I remember there's one particular guy who played wide receiver who everybody on the team just like this guy's just a sick athlete. Is he's, he's off the charts in every measurable category, but for whatever reason, it didn't translate to the field, you know, mm-hmm. he, 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 I, I just don't think he was a gamer. And then there's, mm-hmm. there's some kids who look like, what's that guy doing here? But then every single play, he always they're, finds they're, a way. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you have that same experience? I th- yeah, that was fascinating too. Uh, what's the saying they have a football look like Tarzan play like Jane and you, you just <laughs> don't get it. You're like, I wish I was six two two twenty. You know, I, let me have that <laughs> if you're not yeah, no use kidding it. right <laughs> um yeah. but no definitely for sure you see it and it kind of boggles your mind they have everything like i don't get it uh yeah i don't i i, I it still, still can't be explained you see they they still make these mistakes to this day in the nfl with the draft and the combine numbers these guys get picked because of their measurables and- exactly exactly um well, so so it sounds like I mean, did you find sort of inspiration to 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 work harder to skip an extra step or to jump over the higher table uh, did that continue in college because you might not have been you know as six five two sixty like some of these other guys did you feel like you had a little bit of a chip on your shoulder that you had to work work harder for sure I think I didn't I didn't think I realized I had you know I probably developed a little bit of little man's complex in college. Because in high school, everyone's pretty much, you know, within range. And then, right. like, oh, I'm a small guy on the team now. I'm going to show them I'm not afraid. or I'm going to get under that weight, too. Or, you know, I'm going to push myself a little harder. So, yeah, no, I definitely carried that with me. You start, you know, surrounding yourself like-minded people. Because, like you said, it's a bigger pool of those type of uh, athletes with that mindset that are just pushing themselves past their limits. So, yeah, yeah, you you start hanging out with that guy more. I want to see what you're eating because I need to eat, you know, that. <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's in your cereal? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, can you share for, for the audience? I, I, I think, well, let's, how do I say this? I'm not sure it's widely understood at a place like San Diego State, big time college football, um, how much time and effort goes into the sport versus school. So could you sort of explain how, what your life is like as a big-time college football player? It's, it's, it's a full-time job. Um, that's It's completely a full-time job. And at the time I was in school, you're not necessarily being compensated for it beyond, you know, your scholarship and 
few meals. So you're really working with just an end goal in mind or a hope in mind if you have dreams to play beyond that point. But it was literally, I can think of waking up 5 a.m. and you might, have, one year we did practice in the morning, but normal, you might have 5 a.m. workouts, um, weight room fill, then you go to class, then you're done with that, you come back, watch film, you might have to go to study hall, you look up, it's 10 p.m. Um, and then you want to have some sort of social life, hang out. Something's got to suffer, right? It's like, Football, yep. school, social life, you can only pick two, right? So some years school might suffer and you're having fun and playing well or football might suffer, but you're, you know, and you're trying to find that balance that works for you and what you're trying to really work towards and you're yep. 18 years old, 19 years old, you still, yeah. try to, you still try to figure out who you are as a person. But yeah, uh, completely agree that, that, um, that workload, uh, and there's a lot of people that kind of, I want to say, depend on you to perform. But like you said, it's big time football. There's a lot of eyes. There's, uh, they're paying your head coach a certain amount of money. He has to perform. So you, you got to show up for this institution and you can kind of feel that downward pressure um, to, 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 yeah, to be accountable. So, and you feel it throughout the building and you see what is the difference between years with success versus years without it. Um, so that's all all an element of it and plays a role into you know, how you show up and perform. Yeah. Yeah. That was very well said. Very well said. Um, yeah. So early in the morning before class, class, and then the entire rest of the day. Yeah. Football. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. And then if you want to, if you want to separate yourself, you have to find a way to do more. Right? Um, yeah. I'll never forget it. And then, Depending on what school you go to, you might have some professors that are football friendly or athlete friendly and some professors that are not. You notice some schools, a lot of athletes have the same major because they might have a relationship with the athletic program as far as understanding that schedule. And this these kids might miss some Fridays. Are you going to be flexible as far as them making up assignments or tests? And I'll never forget I had a teacher who was not what we would call football friendly and we would literally show up. We're sprinting from a workout in the morning, trying to make it to an eight o'clock class, still have our sweats on. And he would just be so upset, like that we were interrupting his code. 801, 802. Mm -hmm. It's just like, here you guys go, you know? And then now you're dealing with that. Like now you have this negative perception. Right. And they it's not necessarily. They think you're not trying and that without the fact that they don't realize you've been up since 4 30 killing yourself exactly and they're looking at you like why are you so lazy you can't get to class on time right exactly yeah yeah so. i hear you that drives me crazy i think it's i think it's a lack of i mean i think it's ignorance frankly it's you know, <laughs> really a lack of empathy not exactly. not understanding what other people are doing or going through but um i'm curious you mentioned you know the, the commitment to hawaii and and you didn't want to go on recruiting trips you guys had to travel with the team for away games right mm -hmm. so how'd that I, go i mean yeah i had to kind of um, get broken into that. I remember my first few flights, I'm holding my seat, you know, people laughing <laughs> at me. Um, it's funny you think about how much growing up I, you do in, you know, that period of time. The first time I saw snow, we were playing an away game against uh, Colorado State, I believe. And I just remember we were driving up to the stadium. You know, and they, were, they took a picture of me because I just looked so dumbfounded. Is that, oh, wow. is that snow? Like, I've never seen snow fall from the sky, but... Um, that's cool it's cool yeah grow up like that go through those experiences like lifelong friends i'm almost 40 now and i'm we still have the same jokes you know uh yeah. so it's cool that they got to witness you grow up and you grow up with them but things like flying and now i'm like a by the time i love college flying is nothing to me you know that's cool right yep yep so how far what was the furthest game you guys had to go to while you were playing we actually played against hawaii when i was in school we uh Oh my, my goodness. Uh, yeah, my uh, junior year, yeah, we went out to Ohio State. So going the opposite way, not as far, but yeah. We, yeah. Uh, we had some Big Ten matchups that got us out out, uh, out in that direction. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so you, you mentioned teammates and still having a lot of great relationships and a great group of friends from that time period. I want to talk for a minute about, you know, Football is not tennis. It's not golf. You got eleven guys on the field. 
And um, what, what interests me so much, especially you know, having gotten older and dealing with it um, on the business side of things, just the the group dynamics. I mean, the, the buzzword in the corporate world is, is culture, right? The company culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and how it, it's not always, you know, you have the 11 best athletes does not mean that's the best offense or best defense. Um, and as I think you, you probably know, well, it has so much to do with the trust and the respect and just the, all the different dynamics go on between people. What, what did you learn, you know, throughout your career, or particularly in college about the importance of teamwork and why you need that to, for a winning formula. I think the the biggest lesson I learned throughout football, the reason why I would like encourage people to pay attention to the sport or even participate if they can is just accountability. Oh, uh, mm. it's 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 so important and it transcends and it goes across everything you do. And it, I mean, you know, you're a quarterback. I I can't do my job if you don't do yours, and you can't do your job if I don't. I can't, I have to be able to look at you and look you in the eye and admit when I messed up, I wasn't, I didn't show up. Let's move forward. And that's it. The eye in the sky don't lie. You, you yeah, missed that, I mean. you, you missed that tackle. I missed that tackle. I won't miss it next time. <laughs> Guess what? I can't miss it next time. That's yeah. my boy. That's, that's like right. my brother next. I don't want to let him down. So I think that's, that's the biggest lesson I've always took away from. Oh, and I and I super appreciate it. and I can see honestly a difference in myself as I transition into other things in life. Those who play team sports, particularly football, and those who didn't, I could just like accountability when you being able to own your wrongs, being able to call somebody on it the, out on theirs and not be malicious. You just want the best for them because the best for us, right? Yeah. And I take and I take it to heart and just get better. Like, all right, cool, let's move on. Yep. And I love that. Yes. Gosh, I do too. That was, that was very, very well said. I've got five, I actually have five kids of my own and every one of them will play a team sport. Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for, for that exact, exact reason. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's just so interesting. And, and one of the really fascinating things about humans is I don't know how golfers and, and tennis players, nothing wrong with those sports, but I don't know how they get and stay motivated and stay in the moment to compete, you know, because like you, like you were mentioning, you know, you're, you're on the field, all of you, you've got a cramp, you feel tired or, oh, wow. you know, you're not doing well. well. What motivates you is, I mean, that's your boy over there, right? So, yeah. you, and he's, everybody's going to be upset if we don't play well, if we don't win. I gotta, I gotta put out. I gotta suck it up, get rid of this cramp, and, and keep driving on because for my buddies. Yeah, exactly. And um, that is, uh, I, I think, if you could bottle that up, you know, you could, you'd, you'd be a very rich man uh, uh, because I think that that so many people in the corporate world try to create that or recreate that um, that that motivation and that energy. But it's not. It's very difficult to find. It's, yeah. it's very difficult to find. What was what was was your cod? Did you guys have um, a pretty good team team chemistry and, and culture at the college level? Did you guys have some good teams? I was I would say yes. We have, and that's that's the thing. You can tell the difference year to year when when you have that versus when you don't, right? So um, we did have some years where there was some disconnected, and it's and you get to see it's like it starts with leadership. Um, not to like point fingers, but whether it's the, the, the coaching staff or the upperclassmen or the veterans on the team, it kind of starts there. So I would say throughout my time at San Diego State, uh, yeah, we had some really good culture and so really good bonded, well-bonded teams in that regard. But then there were some years where it was like every man for themselves. It almost felt like, in, and it, it impacts how you perform for sure. Yeah. Amen. Did you have the same? Did you have the same um, head coach throughout all your whole time there? So I was I was fortunate. I had the same head coach. The one that recruited me, uh, we lo- he was fired after my uh, 
my junior year. So my senior year, I had a new one. That sucks to transition into your last year. But I did have the same uh, defensive coordinator my whole time as a cornerback. So I, I'm grateful for that. So some some changes and you get to see change in regime and you get to feel like I'm not your guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. A new yeah, head yeah, coach yeah. comes in, the seniors, he's just kind of like, you know, I got to get- Somebody else recruited him. Exactly, that whole thing. So Yeah. I yeah. have to experience that a little bit. What was, so what, I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what was that like? How much of a difference was it? I mean, I couldn't agree more that, that the tone, everything is set from the top, right? Mm-hmm. The culture, how, it's, how everything's going to work. How much of a change was it from your junior year to your senior year? Um, and, and what was different? I think it's just style. You know, you get, you get, like I said, you come in as an 18-year-old, this is your first impression of how college football is supposed to be. You don't really know anything. I mean, now yeah. these days, kids are just hopping around. That wasn't an option, right? So it's like, this is it. This is his strength coach. That's what his strength coach is supposed to be like. I've never had one. You know, so yep. I think just any change would have been disruptive to me because that's all I knew. Um, so I think it's just... A little bit of young adult being a little bit, re- you know, all of us, we were a little bit rebellious of the new, like, just not understanding. Um, and then I think maybe looking back, like, if he just communicated his vision differently to us so we can just understand and get that buy-in. But I thinking about that also, that's probably a really hard job to do, right? Just come in and completely change the way things are being done. Uh, yeah. And I think some things you do, uh, you know, you need to stick. Sometimes you need to carry it. And I guess finding that balance. I think yeah. for me, it was just, we went from, I don't know. And they came over from the big 12. And that's okay. There's a difference in that in itself. Right. So, uh, yeah. I think it was a lot of those guys weren't actually from California. Oh. on that staff, right? There's just cultural differences, small things that, you know, uh, so I think just even connecting off the field was a little, yeah. like, missed there, but so I think those are all things I noticed, and then just being immature, really, as a as an athlete and as someone to be coached. Right, right. That's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, the, the just, just relatability, which, which helps to build trust and and helps with the communication can, can be, can make a huge impact. Well, so if you, before we get onto your pro career, if you could go back, um, and redo your college career, is there anything that you would change? Football you know, wise? I, I always, I always try to ask myself this in the moment. Like if you look back on this moment, will you regret anything? What could you be doing different right now? And every time I look back, I always tell myself you could have worked a little harder. And, mm. I, and I I feel that way about college football. Uh, in the moment, I felt like I was working as hard as I could have, but then you just learn yeah. more and you're like, you could have worked a little harder. So, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, that's just beating myself up. I think uh, one of the best for myself, my former self. So. Right. I think I would have worked right. a little harder. I think on the field, one thing I do regret is I, I stopped catching punts for whatever reason. I think early, I just wanted to focus on playing cornerback. Uh, I think I, I was a pretty decent part returner and I should have kept going with that. But other than that, so I you think t- you told him, you said you didn't want to, you didn't want to return yeah, I came anymore. In, I came in as a freshman, I was catching punts and then, um, and I think I was just like, I want to be really good at cornerback and focus on being really good at cornerback. I could have done both. I could have balanced that. Yeah. It's hard to know, man. I mean, right. like you said, 18 <laughs> year old kid, Whole life just changed. It's hard to have that perspective back, right. back when you're that age. But uh, well, look, I'll I'll say if it, that's pretty amazing. Um, if those are your only regrets, I'd say you 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 maxed it out yeah. pretty well in college. Uh, yeah, I try I try to think so. <laughs> well, look, you made it. You made it uh, to the big leagues um, after you graduated. So tell us tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So. Um, it's funny when leading up to the draft process, I re- that's similar to recruiting. You're dealing with like agents starting to reach out to you like, oh shoot, I might actually play in the NFL. You have some up- upperclassmen that have moved on that you're like, I used to compete with and against this person and he's in the NFL. So, Whoa, it's possible, right? You start flirting with the idea. 
And then yeah. the, leading up to the draft, teams are calling. It's actually actual. I remember I had a little list of maybe 15 other teams that had reached out to me. And they uh, leading up to that, they're like, is this your draft day phone number? Yes. What's your backup line? And, you know, I was like, oh, shit. like I might get drafted, you know? Wow. Yeah. Um, it's like my dream was to play college football. Now these NFL coaches' names I recognize are calling people. But um, I didn't get drafted. And that was heartbreaking, right? Because I like, it was like a roller coaster. I built myself like, oh, it might happen. And then it didn't. I'll never forget a uh, coach for the Baltimore Ravens called me, the DB coach at the time, uh, Dennis Sturman. He called me. I think the draft was still going. And I was, he called. I said, hello. Hey, this is from Baltimore Raven. I was very aware of like who had picks left. Like they don't have any picks left. <laughs> he's like, he's like, uh, and I was, I was already like pissed off at the time. So he can hear it in my voice. He's like, look, we want to bring you in as an un, un, you know, undrafted free agent. I don't know whatever response I gave him. He can tell I was upset. He's like, look, I know you're upset, and like I can respect that because I know you, that means you're competitive, you care. Um, but I think you need to realize like it's an opportunity to play in NFL still. And he ended up, he's like, I'm going to call you back in an hour. <laughs> and, and he hung up and I thought about it. I was like, "My play, wait, the Baltimore Ravens want me on their team. You know, like, it had yeah. to be. Uh, you know, the excitement kicked back. Like, it's still a chance. Oh, uh, And from that moment on, I was like, next thing you know, you're on a plane to Baltimore, signing a Nikki free agent contract. Next thing I know, I'm in a team meeting and it's Ray Lewis over there. Like, <laughs> I always wow. joke like the first, so I, they do a rookie mini camp first. And I'll just say this really quickly. Uh, I said the jump from high school to college was bigger because of like, I think mostly because of size and development. But when you go from college to NFL, it's like, it's basically, to me, it felt like an all-star game. Everyone does their job. Everyone's going to be where they're supposed to be. It's like, oh, this, everything's working how it, you know, it's like, the best of the best, so as best it should be. Best. Wow. Um, and then we get the rookie camp, and you're like, okay, like you really have to come with it if you want to make a team, especially as an undrafted free agent. And then you see the vet come, and you're like, I always, I always say too, it was, it was like tears. Um, there's, there's guys that are you don't. They're like a, a pinch of guys that you're like, wait, how does he? How is he here? There's a lot of guys in that middle where you could see like. And you see, if you look at your favorite team's roster five years ago, there's going to be a ton of different names. Those are those guys I'm talking about. They're just, there's a lot of good players that can fill that role. Then, right. there's that, then there's that top tier where it's like the Ed Reeds and the Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis. Ter yeah. And you're like, oh, I see why you're there. <laughs> and, <laughs> really? And it's, and it's evident, yeah. So, it, so it's, it's evident sort of in every aspect, from the meetings to their knowledge of the game to just everything. I was, um, I say to this day, Ed Reed was the best football player I've ever seen. Like, I'm, I got to be in the DB room with him, watch film, see how he practiced, see how he carried himself. It's, he has the size, he had the speed. He's obsessed with getting better. He always carried around that, um, it wasn't an iPad, but he's watching film all day. That's it. Uh, I'll never forget one day of practice. He, after flying around, making plays, interceptions, being everywhere he's supposed to be, and then some. You know, the rookies have to carry your pads and he took his shoulder pads off and he had a weight. I'm like, come on. Like, Under his pads. <laughs> yeah. It's like Oh my gosh. There's there's levels where it's like, no matter what I do, I can't I can't reach that level. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. It, it's just Yeah. And then you're like, that's why he's at Reed. Like Gosh. Well that's really insightful too. I mean you know, talking about what it takes and what differentiates you know, the world's best, the elite, um, from, from every, from everybody else. It sounds like, and, and, and I think this translates into other areas, but it sounds like just having the natural abilities, um, that's not going to do it. That's not going to, that's not going to make you a hall of famer. You've got to, there's got to be some fire, something inside of you that is a uh, that's burning to, to, to that just every day makes you want to be the best is that yeah is that I what would, you saw at the NFL, in the nfl i would agree um it's that combination where you kind of point out earlier it's like those guys where they have everything as far as physically 
And then those guys that they have that heart, that mindset, that, that obsession. And then when those things come together and it's like, yeah, all right. Like you're very, 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 and you you appreciate your blessing. Like, yeah. 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 What what about confidence? How, How much of a role do you think confidence plays? I think I was saying I think it's a big big role. I think a big part of my success for me personally was confidence. I I think I had an overinflated sense of confidence when it came to football. Like you could beat me three times, you're not gonna beat me four. Like I don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um yeah. and you have to think like that. I feel like you you if you don't believe in yourself, like like we said earlier, how is your teammate gonna believe you? How is the coach gonna believe in you? Um how are, you know, how's anyone going to believe in you? If you, if you, I can't see that you believe in yourself. You don't trust yourself to get the job us. And I think, um, yeah, it, it, it feeds off itself. Um, yep. it, it's infectious, right? Like, right. You teammate looks at you like, we're about to crush them. Yeah, we are. Like, well, of course. So, yeah. I think yeah. it's a, it's if a you think so, part. I think so too. <laughs> you can see it. Yeah. If you see in the buildings, um, like the same roster the next year will have a bad record. Like what happened? Is their confidence shaking? Like what's going on? Right. But mm-hmm. I think it's a big part. And I think being, I didn't last long in the NFL, but being there, let me know I, c- I could be there. Right. I'm good enough to be there. It's mm-hmm. just n- numbers or whatever. You know, there's a lot of aspects into, you know, developing a 53 man roster. So, yeah. I, but I know I can, like I'm, I have the ability in that. Yeah. That yeah. that. Well, that, that's another, that's another thing we, you know, we talk about having the athletic ability, having, the, having the, the right mindset, having the right confidence, but there's also a whole lot of just flat out luck, right? Oh, I yeah. mean, there are 32 teams and there are 53 players on each team. And, you know, the Ravens called you and asked you, invited you to become an undrafted free agent, but you you're, you're they, they might have five world-class corners on their team. Doesn't mean that you're not good enough to play in the NFL. You could play on 31 other teams potentially, right? Right. Yeah. So, it's, uh, so I, what's that like? I mean, is that commonly talked about at that level? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's it can be frustrating too um, because you see and you understand there's a business part, right? So if they draft a guy in the second or third round, he's an investment. It's gonna look it's gonna look poorly upon them if they give up on this investment year one, year two, right? So yeah. If I come in as an undrafted free agent and I outperform a third round pick, they have to openly admit that they got it wrong. Or and like I said, that middle area is so close, you could get by keeping the third round pick and let this guy. Because uh-huh. we invest. You get what I mean? So Yeah. We're all aware of it. People they'll they'll joke and say this guy's on scholarship because he got drafted. And you'll see it in you know, you'll see the guys that get drafted in the first round stick around the league a little longer. They might bounce around a couple of teams. Yeah. Get their front office pick. But you you understand it. Uh, it's just part of it. Uh, it, it. It can become frustrating. I used to kind of torture myself about it when I was still in it at that young mm-hmm. age. Like, well, I see there and I'm not. But, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. You can't, you can't look at what someone else had. Uh, I love that. Comparison is the thief of joy. Love that. I might have to steal that one from you <laughs> or borrow it. Uh, no, that's awesome. But, you know, one of the things that frustrates me or that, that I've thought about is we just spent, I don't know, 10 minutes talking about the various aspects, the various qualities that you need or that one needs to be world-class at something. And you see guys, we, we myself included, I mean, if you want to get better, Go get in the weight room, right? You want to, you want to improve your forty time. You want to improve your your explosiveness. You want to you know get stronger, faster, bigger. But things like confidence are extremely important. How do you, there, there's no clear way, or at least that I'm aware of, or instruction or coaching on who's helping who's helping folks increase their level of confidence. Me, mm. you know, I mean, if that's if that's a if you, if you lay out the four or five main things that you need and, you know, some of them are, are, you either have them or you don't, but others I think can be worked on, but they don't ever seem to be 
there, there's no workout. There's no confidence workout. There's no confidence class. And so, you, but you kind of got to get it where you can get it. You mentioned the story of, of your sophomore year in high school, your coach, it was just one comment, right? Just one comment. Hey, I think you could do this if you really wanted to do it. And that made a huge, huge impact on you. What, what, if, what if the comment would have been the opposite, right? What if the comment had been, hey, you sure you want to play football? You might want to find a different sport. I mean, that seems to me could have changed the, tra the trajectory of you as an athlete. W you know, what do you say to the, to the kids out there playing that no confidence is important and may or may not have it? So I think first, believe in yourself, right? If you have a, a dream or a goal, like, because if I'm being honest, there were people, I was that kid that I told you was high hopes, high ambitions, kind of lofty. There were people that were like, hey, you're kind of smart. You should think about this and that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to prove them wrong. I think yeah. that that's part of it. But if there's a specific thing, and even as I transitioned into the corporate world, I feel like my confidence got shaken a little because I was now in a whole different arena. This was not my comfort zone. I could, I can't play cornerback with my eyes closed, but you can throw me into any meeting room and I can get through, right? Because I have so much familiarity. familiarity. And now all right. of a sudden I have to give presentations on things I'm not necessarily, I learned about this in the past three months. I'm So right. the way I try to build my confidence here is just repetition, right? So I'm a, I had to put in that extra time. I'm, if I'm not comfortable on something, I'm gonna keep doing it until it it feels a little more comfortable. That's just how I've always tried to build my confidence. I um I go back to this. I wanted to go back and catch punts again later in my career. I found a punter. We would just go to a park. You gonna punt to me till your legs tire, just so I could get that confidence. Um, so yeah. I think if there's a specific aspect, if it's public speaking, just start doing it. Just force yourself to do it until it's not scary anymore. Um, raise your hand and volunteer and then you're going to stumble you're going to fall but it's going to just be something you laugh at in the future yeah I think that's really that's really insightful man I, that, I think that's you're exactly right I hadn't thought about it necessarily like that but uh, yeah competition is exactly how you increase your confidence that is uh, that's beautiful man that's beautiful but the Ravens weren't your last team right Oh no! You, you, you still had some football left in you. Yeah, uh, I love football, and I think I, I prove it if you look at my Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, after the Ravens, uh, I uh, played arena football for a year. Probably the most fun I had, and I played in the U.S. Real quick, I'm just curious. Real quick, uh, what was that like? It's like, uh, and you know, going from the NFL, the next stop is arena. It's, it was a lot more, a lot more lax. And because it's a very, the whole point of the game is scoring points. 72 to 87 is not an odd football score in that in the arena. It's a 50 yard field. They're going up and down. As a DB, that's very humbling, right? Um, I remember the first, I started as a rookie in the arena league and maybe two weeks and I got, a guy scored three touchdowns on me. I mean, I was mad. I'm I'm not, I'm not, I used to get mad if somebody got a first down on me. You scored three touchdowns on me in one game. And everybody's just like, oh, man, you played great. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so <laughs> I had to like readjust my brain. But I think it had helped me a lot in the future because it, like, I wouldn't beat myself up so much over a small thing. You might yeah. get 80, 87 points on your head. But, but no, hey, it, was, it was a ton of fun. That's cool. Go, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, unique cities like Grand Rapids, Michigan. You know, things like that. It was, it was, yeah. it was, it was cool. Were there a lot of uh, were the, were the the folks that were on your your teammates and the folks you you played against? Were they kind of in a similar position? Yeah, and that's kind of uh, what I was kind of touched on a little earlier. That was around that time where I was my frustration, or where I was kind of comparing myself because I would have teammates that may have had like three or four seasons in the NFL, and now that or guy, I'm like, how did he, like, if he played three seasons, I know I could play, you know? 
Yeah. I'm, I'm starting over this guy now, but he gets to say he's an NFL player. I don't necessarily get to say that. Uh, I used to like really, really, really frustrate at that time. A lot of people would be like, why aren't you in the NFL? You're young. You're good enough. I don't know. You tell me, you know, like I right. can't control it, but, um, yeah. but yeah, it's a ton of, it's a lot of good football players out there. As you know, like they got to go somewhere. So <laughs> yeah. you find them that they're, they're not in the NFL. They're, and CFL, uh, I love. Yeah. Uh, that's why I love supporting leagues like you know the XFL, USFL because these these are good football players. They just need an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, look to get a call from the Baltimore Ravens while the draft is still going on to uh, with an invite to come to rookie camp. Obviously, you know, you're one of the top quarters in in the country. And I'm sure you have thought and questioned this probably to death since then. But I mean, if you were born, you know, maybe one year earlier or one year later, um, it may have been a totally different story. Or if there were a couple of guys that decided to play baseball or basketball instead of football. And um, I think a lot of people let their, you know, they let that define who they are um, as a as a human or, or as, you know, their level of success in life. And, uh, you clearly have not done that, which is very admirable. Um, and, um, you know, you're, you, you have, you're very humble to have done the things that you've done. Um, and you have since then gone on and you now have a, a, a successful non football career at Microsoft, right? Yep. Yeah. So, so, and and you did touch on this a little bit earlier, but what do you feel like being on these teams and, and having the football experiences that you had, do you feel like um, that translates well into corporate world? I think so. Um, and for me, I had a, I kind of had a mindset switch, I think midway through I played Arena three years at UFL, then I played the last four years in CFL, Canadian Football League. And right in the middle of there, I kind of was like, you know what? There are people that wish they even had this opportunity, right? They just they wish they could just play in the A. They wish they could play in the CFL. Stop looking at what you don't have and start focusing on what you do have. From then on, I played so much better. I was so much, I was happier. You know, I was more comfortable. So... Once I had that mindset switch, when I started thinking about transitioning after football, um, I kind of carried that too. And then all the other things we already talked about, right? Like accountability, work ethic, all those things that you just get from sports and just, just like it's, it's ingrained in you is who you are competing. Um, I see that, you know, in my work, uh, I try to be, I try to wake up, remind myself like there's so many people that wish they had a job at Microsoft. Don't forget that, you know, like, yeah, you're lucky. You, you may have earned it, but you still, there's still, like you said, there's luck involved, right? Yep. It was a day later and I missed that call, whatever, right? Right. So definitely I think um, it's made me a better professional. Um, my experience with sports and ups and downs, however you look at them as far as like my professional career. Uh, I think I then now looking back on it, it's all been amazing. Uh, super grateful for it all, but uh, it definitely has made me a, you know, a harder worker. I, I always want to show up for my teammates because that's just who I am now. Like if someone needs me, help me get something done. It moves up my priority. Then, then you get that back in return, right? So, oh, for yeah. sure. Gosh, yeah, I love that. I love that. So you play. So, not to not to backtrack too much, but you so you played four five years professional football. Total eight. 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 Okay, so arena to the US, the UFL, and then Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. I, I snuck in a year there where, um, and I'm good on time, so don't worry. But okay, uh, all right. Um, but to my first year in the UFL and my second year, I went out to Italy and played football out there. Uh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. What that was, was that like? One. There's a book called Playing for Pizza. If you're ever bored, read it. If that's like the experience, but I'll give you the short version. Basically, yeah. uh, one of my uh, 
one of my arena coaches, he's like, he called me, he's like, hey, are you under a contract right now? No. He's like, do you want to play football in Italy? I was like, what? They don't like football in Italy. What are you talking about? He's like, yeah, you talk about soccer? Right. He's like, my uh, my buddy of mine, he's coaching there. Uh, they have three Americans per team. He's like, you, you know, you're not married. You don't have kids. Go out there, pl- go see the world. They give you a car, a fall, and a place to live, and a few euros a month. Like, consider it. I'm, at this time, I'm still trying to play in the NFL, right? So, like, this, yeah. this, this is going to yeah. make my, my <laughs> what this is going to do for my brand, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, then I talked to the, um, the coach. It was actually Doug. I can't remember his last name. Called Coach Doug, Doug Crosby. He played for the Dallas Cowboys as a tight end. Um, so that, you know, obviously gets him credibility. And he's on the phone. He's like, hey, so the way it works out here is each team is allowed three Americans. Usually what people do is they bring an American quarterback, quarter receiver, linebacker, running back type. He's like, what I'm thinking is I'm going to bring an American corner, shut down all these receivers. Oh, he's like, yeah. You're, you're my guy. All right. I was like, who's the quarterback? And he said, Bradley Van Pelt. I don't know if you remember that name, but he went to Colorado State. So he was in my conference in college. He got drafted by the Denver Broncos. He was a really good quarterback. So I was like, oh, this is legit. Like, yeah, he's a good player. So I'm like, it, let's go. He's like, can you come like two days from now? I was like, well, okay. Give me through oh the week. Oh, gosh. Give me through the weekend. So um, I go out. I, 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 I did it, obviously. And when I flew out there, First thing I asked Bradley, I was like, Bradley, how'd you, how'd you end up here? Like, we just played the, played together in college, like three, played against each other in college like four years ago, and you were in the league. He's like, oh, I'm trying to break into the wine industry. Like, he's like, <laughs> he's like I'm sh-. so I was like, oh, I've been set up. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. So I'll never forget the my wine friend. industry. So most of, most of the athletes there were guys that maybe played D3 level so bradley and okay. i were, were like the only d1 college football players out there so my first game we happened to be playing against the best team there i can't remember the team there they were under i think undefeated um and i literally was sleep the whole time on the bus it was not very professional like i'm talking about like a high school like bus we're kicking oh, off in, we're kicking off at 30 minutes i'm like like stretch and <laughs> I, I think i had um I hadn't played receiver since high school, but I had to go both ways. I think I had like 10 catches for 179 yards or something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was, it was, it was so fun. It was just like going back to high school and because it's literally three Americans who grew up playing football and the rest of the guys on the field are just new to the sport. So you're just like running around. Oh, but so we had away games in Paris, Valencia, Spain. It was that type of like experience. Wow. Right? So we're hanging out the night before. And me and Bradley are throwing post corners the next morning. You know, it, it was like, <laughs> yeah, well, it I was bet not, that was fun, though. That had to be fun, wasn't it? How long man, was the season? It was it was six months, but I, I ended up getting a call from my next UFL team, so I left early. Um, oh. So I spent three months there, but it, no, it was super fun. I, like, I would encourage people if they had that chance to take it because like, I got to live in Italy for three months. You know, like, right yeah. outside of... Right outside of oh, um, I was at Bergamo, um, okay. right outside of Milan. So it's like fashion capital wow. of the world. We would just go hang out in Milan during, you know, in our downtime. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> so now that wow, was- Wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. So then you went back to- UFL. The UFL, two, okay. Played two more years there. Then that league folded and I went up to Canada and kind of found a home with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Yeah, really, really good four years there. Won the championship, great cup. I was, that was like, nice. I was pretty active in the community. It was that was kind of like my football home, I would say, because I spent the most time there. Got most like ingrained. They actually just flew okay. us out for the ten year reunion of our great cup championship. So I got to see maybe two weeks ago. Oh. So I got to hang out with all those guys. Yeah. I bet that was cool, wasn't it? Oh, super cool. Yeah. Got the got the. Uh, the way I described it was, you know, the thing you miss most is the locker room. It's like we yeah. got to steal that moment back again for a weekend. We're all in oh, town man. together. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really, that is really cool. That's a, that's a that's an insightful comment in and of itself that what you miss most is the locker room. Isn't it interesting how when you look back, what you missed the most are the things that you didn't even really realize that you were doing. Right. Exactly. Oh, for sure. For sure. It's, it's just even having... 
surrounded by like-minded people, same goal day in, day out, day in, day out. You just right. take, you take that for granted. Yeah. Grinding, just grinding. Uh, I love that. So when did you, so when did you transition out of football? What year did you transition out of football permanently? It was, so my last season was 2015. Wow. Okay. Um, so what I did was I was, I was, I was fortunate enough to play at years. So you get to see a lot of people transition. And that, well, that's something I'm passionate today about helping athletes transition away from their career. Cause I got to see a lot of friends and close, you know, that it's, it's, it's hard, right? Yeah. Uh, I bet. Your identity changes, your income stream, your, a lot that you're wrapped up in your football career and, a lot of people struggle. They're not, they're not doing as well. There's a lot of data and statistics around it. Like we've all heard about. So I was just witnessing it. I was like, how am I going to transition better? Or how can I make this as smooth as possible? And I started, um, I said, I told myself I'm going to business school. I'm going to go get my MBA. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> I'm going to go yeah. figure it out. I'm going to go spend two years in a MBA program, figuring out my next move. I was early on, uh, my uh, roommate in Canada used to joke, like, I would be studying for the GMAT, like, study film, study for the GMAT, study. like, that was, in the, <laughs> in the, in the off season, I, I um, took the GMAT, applied to schools, I got accepted to University of Virginia, at the time of the top 15 business school. Um, yeah, Darden. Yeah, Darden. Uh, so then, literally, 2015, I went into my last season playing, knowing I was going to go to Darden. So that was probably the most, it was like a weight on my shoulder I didn't know I had because it was like so much oh. was depending on football always, my livelihood. So now it's like, I know what my next step is. It's like a freeing feeling, I guess you'd say. Yeah, wow. I can imagine. And then the next fall, I was sitting in a classroom at Darden when uh announced my retirement in the CFLs. Like Kim, <laughs> it was the craziest thing. While you were uh, in class, it came, it, the press, it got released. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. What did that feel like? It was, um, it was surreal. It was kind of, it's kind of, it's crazy. Like when it's over, like it, dang, it's over. Um, I'm still s super competitive, a lot more active at that time. I still felt like I had like a, you know, something to give as far as being on the field. We all feel that yeah. way. I, Still kind of feel like that right now, if you ask me, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. But yeah, it was, it was, it's crazy. But it's like, again, I try to just like refocus on the moment. Like, all right, you have an opportunity at this really good business school. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, that's great, man. Darden is a hell of a school. Did, did your, did your classmates in business school know that you were a professional football player? It's, um. It sucked. Well, it didn't suck because I didn't want that to be my identity come in, but it quickly became my identity because- Oh, really? You have to talk about what you do before, what you did before school and like all I could uh, talk about was football, right? So- Yeah. But uh, it's the Socratic method there, a lot of um, conversational teaching where it's not a lecture, we're just bouncing ideas, all the whole ideas that have diversity of thought, right? So- Yeah. Everybody has these different backgrounds, different experiences added to the conversation. So- uh, I had to like embrace it, but I just didn't want it to define me. But it, you know, people were, you realize there's a lot of, um, a lot of different backgrounds. So it made it cool. I had one of my really close friends is that he, he was a pitcher for the Houston Astros. There was a guy in my class that was also, he rolled on the Olympic teams. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had a couple more athletes, but I was definitely like, bro, you used to play football. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. But it, you say, it sounds like you were, you, we're at a point in your life where um, you could be very thoughtful and intentional about, look, I'm moving on. I don't want this to be my identity. Um, you know, it's obvious you got a great head on your shoulders. So hopefully it wasn't too painful uh, to have to give it up. Yeah. I mean, the, the for me, it didn't really, it didn't hit me. It, it was like a delay for me because like, uh, I, like I threw myself in business school. Like, it's su you're super busy, right? Super busy. And then, so I think for those two years, I was just busy school, school, school. And then that next fall after that, that's when I was like, man, oh. I don't play anymore. You know, I was yeah. a, 
it hit. I think we all have that moment where I don't care what level you play up to. If you spend enough time doing something, you're going to miss it. Right? It's like, but yeah, I definitely struggled. I went through my, you know, I won't, I don't know how I would label it, but it, it was, it was definitely a, a hard point. Like letting go like completely. That's not yeah. me anymore. Uh, separating myself from you. So, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Gosh, look every, every now and then, something will strike me or I'll smell the grass yeah, after it's yeah. been cut and uh, it takes me back. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if every sport is like football, uh, in terms of the ability for a sport to make such a tremendous impact because I, I don't know if it's because of the violence of it that, you know, that, that you, you participate, you know, with your brothers in violence. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that that forges some type of bond that is unique. Um, may, maybe it, it might be the same in baseball. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, for whatever it's worth, I, I, I hear you on that. And it's amazing the type of relationship that you have with your teammates. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. He played basketball past college. So. I was telling him about our trip, my trip to Canada. I was like, man, that was so cool. You know, just kind of get that locker room feeling back. And I was like, is it like that for you guys? No. He's like, basketball locker room, nothing like a football locker room. He's like, oh, really? He's like, you got to think um, how big the football locker room is. Uh, the likelihood of you having more connection is uh, just a numbers game, right? He's like, on a basketball team, there's like 15 of us. Half you might not like. If you're just different from, you know, like you ain't yeah, one, yeah, of, yeah. one or two boys, but it's like, yeah, we have a no, room. I, that, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, you got yes. like 60 or 70 guys in the locker room. You have like little groups of, you know, really mm -hmm. close friends and other groups of, of friends. I could see that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, look, Terrell, I appreciate it. I want to be thoughtful uh, of your time. We've already gone over. This has been awesome. Um, you, you, your background and experience, you know, just standing on its own is interesting, but the, the way that you describe it and explain it and your humility and uh, how you can articulate um, what you went through is, um, is very admirable. So I, I, I genuinely appreciate it. I, there's, there's one question that I ask every guest um, and it's not meant to be the truth or, and God forbid it doesn't happen. But if, like I said, God forbid, if you were at, at your office and there was a fire at your office and you had the chance to run back in and grab one thing before the building, you know, went down in flames, what, what is it that you would, would grab? My, uh, so it's tricky because I work from home. So, well, your then your 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 home office or your house. How about that? If there's one thing that if you're if if I hope it doesn't happen, but if your house is on fire and you could run in and you could grab one thing quickly and then run out with it, what would you grab? I mean, so unfortunately, I had a son that passed away, and we have his ashes on the our mantle so i would i would go get my son for sure man that is a that's the most touching um answer i've gotten to that question and um uh, my heart goes out to you guys no, i appreciate it yeah um that yeah that was a tough one but couldn't leave couldn't leave my guy behind i had to go get him. all the rest of the stuff is, is replaceable i love it i love it best answer we've had best answer we've had Again, Terrell, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. I've got your uh, your contact info, and uh, I'll reach out, touch base, just so we can stay in touch. No, definitely, really appreciate it. Great conversation, man. It was good to connect with like minded folks. So, absolutely, man, absolutely. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, look, take care. Have a great rest of your week, man. We'll talk soon. All right, you too. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Trill. Don't forget, everybody, you can find Boundary Breakers in a lot of places. You can watch our episodes on the Boundary Breakers YouTube channel, or you can listen to each podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the other major podcasting platforms. Thanks for listening.